sorry. So I'm Karine Lennox, I'm senior lecturer in human rights here at the School of Advanced Study. Um, welcome to the seminar on the, uh, Columbia in the Global Call for Reparations. This seminar is being co-organized with the Center for Latin American and the Caribbean Studies, and I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Jamile Pinero Diaz, who's lecturer in Latin American and Caribbean Studies and director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, also here at, at SAS. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome you today for this session. Um, I'm really particularly honored to welcome back Dr. Esther Ojolari, who's our, our main speaker today. I say welcome back because she has been a, both an MA and PhD uh, alumna of the School of Advanced Study um, and uh, has been uh, you know, uh, an active contributor to our, our community in various ways, and we're pleased to be able to host her today. Um, she is co-director of the Boabad Center for Racial, Gender, and Environmental Justice based in Cali in Colombia, and she's going to be taking us through today some of the opportunities and challenges for a reparations agenda in Colombia in the new global uh, context. And of course, this is a very exciting opportunity to see Colombia's leadership on this issue. Um, I'll let her say a little bit more about what she has been doing um, in recent years in her talk. I'm very pleased also to be able to welcome Professor Peter Wade, Professor of Social Anthropology at Manchester University, who is joining us as, uh, as a discussant. Um, you, many of you will know him already his, for his expertise in Colombia and particularly on Afro-descendant movements in Colombia and also theories of race and ethnicity in Latin America more broadly. So welcome, Peter, as well. So um, folks, if you do have questions, you will be able to raise your hand or put questions in the chat. But for now, I'd like to invite Esther to introduce us to her, okay. her experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Corinne. Should I stand up here? Yeah, I'll share the screen. <clears throat> Great. So, well, thank you, first of all, Corinne, for the, for the invite to speak here. And thank you to everyone for coming. For, uh, here in person and online. Um, and thank you, uh, Peter, for joining us as well and the Institute of Latin American Studies. So um, my presentation today is a kind of combination of uh, my thesis work, which was on transitional justice and reparations in Colombia, and then my activism work over the last um, eight years, 10 years that I've lived in Colombia working with um, black organizations, uh, working on trans transitional justice and peace building, um, working on issues of reparations for slavery, and more recently now supporting the new government on their reparations agenda. So this is a bit of a kind of mixture of academic and practical experience and work. So I'll just share, I'll just put this too big. Um, so I'll give quick context really on like, the arguments and, and the movement for reparations in general to give an idea about what we're talking about when we talk about the global reparations movement and then I'll focus down on on what's happening in Colombia. So first of all just to, to give a quick introduction I think it the first point um, to begin with when we're talking about reparations and we're talking about reparations for colonialism slavery and the transatlantic slave trade, is that um, we must reaffirm and recognize that reparations are a human right. So um, without going into too much detail on all of the different um, instruments um, and measures that there are for reparations, everyone under international human rights law has a right to effective remedy or, re or recourse um, when their human rights are, are violated, in particular when there are grave violations of human rights. And so there are several instruments um, within international law that recognize that to different degrees this, this right to a reparation or recourse, um, including the International um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the, Con uh, the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on um, Against Torture, and others. There's also been a lot of precedent set by different human rights treaty body mechanisms um, recognizing in one way or another the right to some kind of reparation for victims of violations of their rights. Hi, um, the, um, in 2001, the International Law Commission draft articles on state responsibility began to define um, the components of reparations and in 2005, the basic principles and guidelines on, on the right to remedy and reparation I'm just gonna put this so I can see, um, for victims of gross violations of human rights um, also complemented that. And so with the evolution of human rights law, there are kind of five key elements or components to reparation. So the right to restitution, the right to compensation, 
the right to rehabilitation, which often means kind of different measures around um, perhaps psychosocial care or different kinds of um, more sort of care focused um, measures for reparation satisfaction, which is often re referred to as symbolic measures for reparations, memory exercises, truth exercises, monuments, um, that kind of thing, and then guarantees of non repetition. Um, and we can also cite jurisprudence from the International Criminal Court and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights around reparations for victims of violations of human rights. And as the world of transitional justice has developed and emerged over the last sort of 30 years, um, there's been an increasing focus on the right to reparations for victims of grave violations of human rights in the context of armed conflict or in the context of dictatorships, um, and particularly focusing on atrocity crimes, so genocide, war crimes, um, and crimes against other crimes against humanity. So when we're talking about the right to reparations for slavery and colonialism, it's really based on that human rights framework. Um, I like to cite when we're talking about the case for reparations, um, uh, the intervention of Lord Gifford in 1993, who participated in the um, Abuja meeting, international meeting on reparations in Nigeria. Because um, I think he really laid out very well the three kind of key arguments for why victims or descendants of victims of slavery um, deserve and have the right to reparations. And so first of all, he says, because the mass kidnap or kidnapping of an enslavement of Africans was perhaps the most cruel crime, criminal enterprise in recorded human history. First of all, please excuse this, because I think I had it in, in Spanish and then I translated it back to English so some of the words were slightly off. Um, but of course, we're talking about a crime that involved trafficking, kidnapping, um, separation of families, sexual violence, torture, forced labor, genocide, ethnocide, and crimes against humanity. Um, and I think it's really important to focus on that because often when we talk about slavery, just kind of use the word slavery and it's something that happened in the past and we forget about all these different types of violences that took place and were inflicted upon um, men, women and children as well. Um, the second argument is that there, no compensation was ever paid to um, the victims of slavery by any of the perpetrators. Um, and I, um, in, on the contrary, um, many of the enslavers or many of the people who were um, perpetrators of this crime received uh, compensation. Um, so I don't know if, if you're aware of the Slavery Legacy Project, for example, by UCL, um, that did a whole study around the amount of compensation that um, slave traders and those who owned sweet businesses basically were paid out as payouts for the loss of their assets when slavery was abolished. And we're talking about in today's money billions of, of pounds or billions of dollars, um, but some families re received up to 20 million pounds payouts. Um, and in the case of the UK, I learned, as I learned from Hilary Beckles of the, of the um, Reparations Commission of the Caribbean, um, that money that was paid out to, um, to, the, to the perpetrators of this crime was paid by the government. The government took out a loan to be able to pay that money. And the government was still paying back that loan, I think, I believe until 2010. So anyone here who paid taxes um, until 2010 in the UK was probably contributing to that payout that um, these people uh, received. And then the third argument is that the consequences of the crime continue to be massive, both in terms of the enrichment of the descendants of those perpetrators, um, countries and individuals, and in terms of impoverishment of Africa and her descendants. So we're talking about economic legacies, um, you know, people like uh, Franz Fanon, Hilary Beckles, um, Walter Wadney and Eric Williams have all identified how Europe pretty much owes its wealth and its status and its place in the world to colonialism and enslavement. Um, but there are also intergenerational uh, damages, cultural, psychological, spiritual, identity. Um, the, the, the legacy also includes the, la the long-lasting ideologies of racism and white supremacy, which were really a tool used to justify enslavement. And the fact that um, if in many ways slavery is a continuing crime, even though slavery was abolished, um, 
there are now new ways of um, what we call new forms of slavery. And many Afro-descendant people all around Latin America, for example, still work in very poor conditions and very unsafe conditions in the same job jobs, now their jobs, in the same activities um, that their ancestors would have worked in, cotton picking, sugarcane um, cutting or cultivating, mining, um, domestic labor as well um, in infrastructure. So um, this argument then for reparations or the call for reparations is definitely not a new one. In fact, people have been calling for reparations for the, for the crimes they suffered since the, the period of enslavement. And there are cases of people who received very small amounts of um, compensation even, even before, before slavery was abolished. But the main uh, kind of movement of reparations grew in the 20th century. And we can point to the Rastafari movement, for example, in um, or the Rastafari people in Jamaica as being pioneers in the call for reparations. So since the 1930s, they were calling for land restitution. Um, in the 1960s, they made formal calls to the British Crown um, for reparations and repatriation to Africa. So the right to be able to go back to Africa without being treated as a foreigner. Um, my baby's crying. <laughs> Um, and in 2004, calls to the British government for compensation and repatriation. Um, in 2007, Jamaica created the National Bicentenary Committee, which um, commemorated 200 years of the abolition of slavery and began to have this kind of national discussion on, on the legacy of slavery. Um, and in 2009, they created the National Reparations Commission. From that, other countries in the Caribbean began to create reparations commissions as well. And those commissions really had the role of investigating, researching um, the damages, the long lasting damages and impacts of slavery in, and beginning to propose measures for reparations that, that, that those countries needed and wanted. In 2013, uh, members of CARICOM, so members of the Caribbean community came together and made a, a regional reparations commission. And that reparation commission made a formal call to several states in Europe um, calling for reparations um, and have um, adopted a 10-point plan for reparations, which includes various different measures around education, um, technology transfer. I think the right to uh, repatriation is in there too, infrastructure, formal apologies, which are part of, of the, rep the symbolic reparations piece, um, another kind of memory and truth and remembrance um, activities as well. In the case of the USA, uh, where there's a very strong reparations movement, um, since uh, the end of the, or since the abolition, abolition of slavery, um, many enslaved people or freed people were promised um, what they said was 40 acres and a mule, which is basically reparations, land reparations. That, for, that promise was never fulfilled. Um, and that has become kind of the flag of the reparations movement in, in, for much of the movement in, that, in the USA. Um, the civil rights movement incorporated reparations into their demands in the 20th century. Uh, in, the, in the 80s, we saw the creation of the National Coalition um, of Black People or Blacks for Reparations in America. And since 1989, um, Congress people, beginning with John Conyers, have been introducing a bill to create a National Reparations Commission to study the issues of reparations and make recommendations. To this day, they still haven't managed to get that bill passed. So every year, John Conyers and then later his um, uh, people who have followed him in his path have introduced that bill. And that bill doesn't even call to repair. It just calls to investigate the need to repair. And, and the fact that that's been blocked for so long shows quite a controversial issue reparations is for a country that has responsibilities. Um, there have been many cases or kind of tort law cases brought in the states around for reparations, particularly against um, local governments in some cases, but also against private corporations. So those companies that profited in one way or another from slavery, um, insurance companies who maybe insured boats that were bringing trafficked people from Africa <coughs> to the Americas, financial companies that lend, lend in money, lent money to enslavers, transport companies, uh, train train rail track rail track companies for example all of those profited off slavery some of them had direct responsibilities so there's been a lot of cases around around them 
Um, and also some cases to do with crimes, racial crimes committed during the Jim Crow era, uh, so post-slavery, but still in the context of racial segregation and racial violence. Um, and more recently, in 2019, the first kind of, there was the kind of first local level reparations initiative adopted, which is the Everston Reparations Fund. So that was kind of a very direct um, fund that black, that African and black people in Everston, I can't remember what that can, could, um, could apply for. Um, in Africa, there's been several kind of big na in uh, regional meetings or na uh, international meetings on reparations over the years. Um, and there's a, an emblematic case that took place um, in, well, began in 2016, which was the Mau Mau case, um, which isn't reparations for enslavement, but it was reparations for crimes committed during colonialism. And this case is emblematic and also set a precedent because um, it concerns uh, basically torture and violence carried out by the colonial regime, British colonial regime in Kenya against um, resistors, we can call them, um, who were resisting against colonialism. It included torture in concentration camps and all kinds of horrific actions carried out. Um, and the victims of that violence and their descendants um, filed a lawsuit for reparations. And the British government tried to uh, argue that um, due to the passing of time and statutes of limitations and the fact that this was a colonial regime and not the current British regime, they didn't have responsibility. Um, but the court um, over, over, went over that decision um, because there was enough evidence, even from the people, even though many of the direct victims had died, there was enough evidence to show because the British colonial regime liked to document everything they did. Um, there was enough archives to show and prove responsibility. So the, the families received um, compensation, economic compensation. Um, there's also been a lot of claims for the restitution of cultural and spiritual property. So these are two images of the Benin of Benin bronzes, for example, from Nigeria that were stolen by the British during colonialism. Many of them are in the in the British Museum over there. Um, many of them are not even on display. They're in the basement because it's better to keep African artifacts uh, hidden away in the basement and keep them safe rather than giving them back to the Africans who probably wouldn't be able to look after them properly, I think is the argument for that one. Um, so there's been a whole movement about um, restoring uh, cultural and spiritual property. Um, um, and um, we have seen more recently some interesting advances and movements on that. So just looking at, at Europe, in 2001, France declared slavery a crime against humanity. Um, in 2019, they established a foundation to create a museum and memorials about the, their role in the slave trade. Um, in 2020, Belgium created a parliamentary commission on its colonial past in, in the DRC and Burundi and Rwanda particularly. Um, in 2020, the European Union declared slavery as a crime against humanity. Uh, and this is very important, as you'll see uh, later on. Um, and then there's several universities and museums who have begun to return or give back um, property that was stolen um, from different countries in Africa. And in 2023, um, one uh, family descendant of enslavers um, founded this group called the Heirs of Slavery um, Group. Um, which is based, which has now got what I read are up over a hundred families who recognise that they received compensation or who recognise that they benefited economically from enslavement, um, coming together and kind of thinking of ways in which they can repair. Um, initially, there was a letter of a formal letter of apology sent to the CARICOM Reparations Commission, um, and they're discussing kind of different forms of economic compensation. Um, much of these more recent uh, advances have really took place in the wake of the Durban Conference, World Conference Against Racism, which took place in 2001 in Durban, South Africa. Um, so Afro-descendant movements from Latin America um, and the Americas in general met at a preparatory conference in 2000 in, in Chile, Santiago de Chile. Um, and brought the issue of reparations to that conference and, um, and then raised it in Durban. In the African um, Regional Preparatory Conference as well, the issue of reparations was put on the agenda. So when 
People from all over the world, governments from all over the world came to Durban in 2001. Reparations was an issue on the table. It was an incredibly divisive issue. Many of the countries didn't want to talk about it. Many of the countries walked out over that issue and the issue of um, Israel and Palestine at the same time. Um, but it, it definitely served to put the issue of reparations on the conversation on the table at the international level. The Durban Declaration and Programme of Action recognises, for example, the roots of racism in colonialism and slavery, or particularly anti-Black racism, the lasting consequences of colonialism and slavery. Um, it recognised slavery or the, the transatlantic slave trade as a crime against humanity. However, the actual wording says, Slavery is a crime against humanity and always should have been, which in other words means, but it wasn't at the time, so we aren't responsible for that crime because it wasn't a crime at the time. Um, so they're still looking to kind of protect themselves in terms of responsibility in many of these states. Um, the, de the document celebrates the official apologies that have been made by some states um, and kind of calls on states to make some kind of actions to um, continue in that vein without directly saying they should make reparations. Many states even refuse to make apologies because the implication of an apology is exception, acceptance of responsibility, um, which could then lead to some kind of judicial um, or interrelate, international relations case for compensation. Um, so what Durban did really was reaffirm the right to reparations, but not the right to reparations for slavery. Um, yeah, good. Um, following Durban, uh, there's a whole load of kind of international mechanisms created around Afro-descendant people's rights. And, and I think Afro-descendant people became kind of a, a specific group subject of rights within the international human rights world. Um, and um, in 2012, uh, 2014 or 15, the International Decade on People of African Descent was, um, was initiated. Um, the original proposal for the programme of action of that decade was reparations, justice and development. But during the negotiations, again, several countries didn't want to um, include the word reparations at that point. So the, the official um, slogan of the decade became rec recognition, justice and development. So even there, there was still all this resistance, particularly from European and US um, states. Um, there's no explicit call for reparations in the programme of action, although it does recognise that some states have made apologies and paid reparations, and it calls on other states to find some ways to contribute to the restoration of dignity for victims. So again, avoiding specifically saying um, repar reparations. But following that, then we've seen a kind of proliferation of discussion on reparations. Um, the working group of experts and people of African descent um, made a call to the USA to make reparations. They held a debate on, on data for racial justice, and there was a very important uh, kind of intervention about um, data around the legacy of slavery and colonialism and how, how we can calculate the debt. Um, the, com the, com the co Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in 2016 made a recommendation to the Vatican to um, make, take actions for moral reparations for the role of the Catholic Church in the slave trade. Um, and the Organization of American States has also had a few kind of reports and advances around the issue of reparations. More recently, um, we've seen within the framework of the UN mechanisms, increasing discussions on reparations. After the, um, the murder of George Floyd, there was an emergency session held at the Human Rights Council on systemic racism and police violence. And the High Commission of Human Rights was commissioned to write a report on systemic um, racism. And this report is actually really progressive in terms of its discussion on, on reparations. And it makes clear links between past and present. So we're talking about police violence, but understanding that this is a legacy of, of the past, recognizing that no state has really accounted for the past at making recommendations for what we call transformative reparations. Um, we now have a UN permanent forum on people of African descent, which has had several sessions um, in which people have discussed the issue of reparations. It's been on the agenda, um, and there's a UN declaration of people of on people of African descent being discussed at the moment. Again, the one of the big issues being discussed is whether or not to include um, an article on reparations. And of course, we have the same states as usual 
pushing against that and other states have been pushing forward. So European states are mainly against. Um, there are a group of, of lawyers um, who are looking to bring a case at the International Court of Justice on reparations. Um, uh, there's various different collectives actually working on that. And then more recently, there's a, what we call the Intercontinental Reparations Agenda being formed, where the U African Union and the Caribbean, well, CARICOM are coming together and putting forward a reparations agenda, uh, which includes after this meeting that took place in 2023, the call for a global reparations fund and the call for this case at the International Court of Justice. So very quickly, um, some of the key debates around reparations, and I can recommend like readings and stuff if people want them to go further into this, but some of the key debates are what kind of reparations are we talking about? Are we talking about individual reparations or collective reparations? Are we talking about uh, symbolic reparations? like apologies and monuments and changing the names of streets and cities or plazas? Um, are we talking about affirmative action? Some people see affirmative action as reparations, others don't. Um, or transformative reparations, which really looks at trying to transform the very structures that were left in place after colonialism. Um, and then in terms of these legal debates, there are some very big questions which we can get into in the questions and answers at the end. But in terms of who are the victims, of, 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 of this crime. So who would be the subjects of reparations? How can we prove causality? So how can we prove that um, what happened in the past has a direct causal relationship with the situation of Afro-descendant people today? Um, issues around statutes of limitations. Um, some would argue as in the Mau Mau case that, um, that the statutes of limitations have expired. This crime was so many years ago that it's now no longer applicable although international law recognizes that crimes against humanity are not subject to um, statutes of limitations. Then there's the big question of who are the responsible parties, um, states, uh, private families, private companies, all those actors that we identified earlier. Um, many of the private companies that would have been involved in slavery have since changed their names, changed their constitution, so they have kind of avoiding succession. Um, whereas states um, do have succession. But then there's this final argument that um, slavery was legal at the time. Obviously, it was made legal by the colonial states. Um, but that has been kind of a way of maintaining impunity. Um, and there's some very dis interesting discussions around that. Um, Tendai Achuemik, who was the previous um, rap special rapporteur on um, racism, argues that this final argument about what we call the intertemporal prin principle, so if a crime was legal, if an act was legal at the time it was committed, you are not responsible. She says that's not necessarily the case, because if that action is still ongoing and continues when that crime becomes a crime, then you are then you hold responsibility. And also, if that act has ongoing consequences when it's, when it's now a crime, you have responsibility. So if you kind of interpret um, the law or interpret the situation, really, of African Senate people from a decolonial perspective, and understand that colonialism and enslavement maybe even hasn't even changed, hasn't really finished in that way, but that we're still living in a paradigm of coloniality and these new forms of enslavement, then we could argue that this crime is still ongoing and these and those that are responsible are still responsible. Um, she said she basically argues that we need to decolonize international human rights law. She says that um, part of the big problem is that international law has not been fully decolonized. And it's full of doctrines that prevent reparation and re remediation. Um, and basically, in, in, states have used international law to protect themselves from their crimes that were committed prior to um, creating international law. So that that you can find in her report of 2019, which is on the UN website. So we come to Colombia. Um, this is the new vice president of Colombia, Francia Marquez, opening the permanent forum on people of African descent in Geneva in 2022. Uh, and she made a great statement where she put the issue of reparations firmly on the table. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with Colombia, uh, Colombia has a large African descent population, mainly concentrated in those areas that are shown on the map. Um, there are kind of disagreements about what the population really is because there's a lot of issues around census taking and self-recognition and also lack of capacity of, of certain institutions to um, in terms of census taking. So the official number actually from 2005 was 10%, 10.5, 10.6%. 
In 2018, it dropped to 6%, but that was um, a gross understatement of the population. And most organizations estimate that black people make up around 26% of the population. Um, <clears throat> the, the results of 2018 was actually taken to the, uh, the constitutional court um, in a law and in a, in a case and, uh, and organizations accused the National Statistics Office of what they called statistical genocide for invisibilizing Afro-descendant people through statistics. Um, so Afro-descendant people face large rates of economic inequality, social inequality. Um, they've also been disproportionately affected by the armed conflict. Um, and um, all of that is seen as a, as a legacy of, of enslavement. So black, this is a seat, this is an image of Buena Ventura where, um, where I lived and worked for a long time during the civic strikes that, that we had in 2017, where people took to the streets to demand their ethno-territorial rights and human rights in general and freedom from violence. So Afro-descendant struggles in, in, in Colombia have um, really been largely around land rights, autonomy and self-determination in different ways. So one of the leading organizations, PCN, has developed his own vision of rights, which include the right to be a collective black community or the right to identity, the right to a space to be a black community or the right to territory and land, the right to exercise being a black community, um, to the right to part political participation and autonomy, and the right to one's own vision of the future, so an own vision of a development and ethno development, and solidarity with um, the international black movement. So it's really kind of breaking down um, what is human rights and taking it from a territorial vision. Um, we have <clears throat> Law 70 of 1993, which recognizes the rights of Afro-descendant communities or black communities to collective um, land titles and other forms of self-government, um, own education, cultural rights, um, land and resources rights as well. Um, and there's very much a connection between the past and the present. So this, this disproportionate impact of the armed conflict on black people, as I said, is seen as a legacy of enslavement. So just to give you one, um, one uh, statistic, I won't go into it in too much detail, but Colombia is one of the countries with one of the highest rates of forced internal displacement in the world um, and has been for a very, very long time. And in a report that uh, a group of us did in 2021, which we presented to the Truth Commission, we found that between 1985 and 2020, 56% of um, forced displacements took part in Afro-descendant territories. So over half of all forced displacements took place in territories where Afro-descendant people live. Um, so the legacy of slavery is really seen as an underlying cause of the armed conflict. Uh, in terms of those communities being underserved and abandoned by the state in terms of development and infrastructure, but also contemporary violence um, being a kind of continuation of colonial violence. So there's this ongoing war against the very existence and resistance of Afro-descendant people. This is a mural that um, we did with um, the community in Buenaventura around um, in, in the framework of the truth and peace building. Um, and it says, we are family, we exist and we resist for our territory. So the struggles are very much around land rights and land being what enables freedom, self-determination self, um, and autonomy. Uh, but that war is all about economic interests that are very much within uh, um, Afro-descendant territories. Many armed groups were financed by private business interests. Um, Black people were often seen as an obstacle to development or an obstacle to economic interests. So displacement was really a strategy to get hold of that land or get access to that land in different ways. And there are also these ongoing aggressions and violence against social leaders as a way of repressing struggles for land autonomy and self-determination. All of this rooted in the racialization of Afro-descendant people. So this is just a quick um, quote from this report that I mentioned. We say the disproportionate and differential impacts and damages caused to Afro-descendant people in the context of the armed conflict represent one more stage in the continuous chain of racialized violence and crimes against humanity committed against us since the transatlantic slave trade and in the context of the extractivist economic project rooted in colonial ideologies of white supremacy, patriarchy and accumulation. 
Racist ideologies and discourse have historically been used to justify the economic and military exploitation of black people or to justify violence and our physical and cultural destruction as a people when we are seen as an obstacle to the colonialist economic project that seeks to control our territories and our natural resources. So it really highlights this ongoing continuous chain of violence. Um, in a workshop that we did on transitional justice, we asked a group of African women, what does, oh, it's in Spanish, what does truth, justice, reparations, and repeti non repetition mean? Um, and on the issue of non repetition, um, one group said, there will only be guarantees of non repetition of violence when we um, receive historic reparations. So the, the war will continue against us until there's some kind of reparation, transformative reparations. So I'll whiz through this. Um, these are several kind of um, norms that have been um, um, adopted by the Constitutional Court, which recognise again this kind of um, relationship between the, the contemporary violence and, and historic injustice. Also, the peace agreement um, in, uh, between the FARC and the government also recognise the historic underpinnings of the armed conflict. Um, so all of this leads uh, Carlos Rosero, who's one of the leaders of the PCN, to say, from our perspective, there's no double reparation. So we're not talking about reparations for the armed conflict on the one hand and reparations for slavery on another. It's actually one and the same. The subjects or the victims were constructed historically. Um, what made it, and what is, what is it that made us weak in the internal conflict? The legacy of slavery. The conditions, the underlying causes of the armed conflict and those inherited from the statement. So what does the internal armed conflict do? It widens the gap between black people um, and the rest of society. And all the legislation around the armed conflict talks about the underlying factors of armed conflict. And for us, those underlying factors are slavery. Um, so what does reparations movement look like in Colombia? Um, PCN in 2000, in, well, many people see the Law 70 as the first reparations law, mainly from outside Colombia, actually. Um, but the fact that it's about restoring um, ancestral lands is kind of a very important, um, a very important legislation around some kind of reparatory justice. Um, PCN in 1994 adopted a document called the Seven Principles of De Development, and one of those principles was compensation. And they argued that compensation was necessary to repair the imbalance between Afro-descendant people and the rest of society. Uh, in 2005, there was a big event on reparations by the National University of Columbia. And after that came uh, a seminal book called Afro Reparations, Memories of Slavery or, or Slavery and Remembrance and Contemporary Social Justice, edited by Claudia Mosquera. Um, and PCN has successively included the issue of reparations in their kind of official um, agenda. In 2009, a group of organizations um, took, the, took a lawsuit at the Constitutional Court, arguing that the law that abolished slavery in 1851 was actually unconstitutional because it created um, a system of inequality by creating payouts for the enslavers and no reparations for the enslaved people, the freed people. Um, so they took this court, this uh, law, this um, law case, um, but unfortunately the case was thrown out by the court because it said it was un inhibited of, from, um, from, 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 from ruling because the law is no longer in effect. Um, or the constitution that it, that it talks about is no longer in effect as we've had several changes of constitution. Um, but what that did is put the reparations agenda on, on the table again. Um, there's been several moments that presidents have kind of what openly talked about this historic debt that the country has with Afro-descendant people, mainly Santos. Um, and um, in 2019, uh, organizations came together and went to Congress and we made an official call for the creation of a um, reparations commission on the 21st of May, which is the Afro-descendant day in Colombia. Um, from resistance to power. So, as you may know, we now have a new government in Colombia um, under the leadership of Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez Mina. Um, and Francia comes from the Afro-descendant movement. She comes from PCN, Proceso de Comunidades Negras. So much of this, um, this agenda has been brought to the government agenda under her leadership. Since the campaign, she began to talk about reparations and really put it on the, on the national discussion. And the programme 
the government program that was adopted just before they were elected or their government program says um, we shall or let us repair the historic debt with Afro-descendant Black, Raizal and Palenquero people, so that's different types of Afro-descendant peoples in Latin America, uh, victims of the slave trade, enslavement and structural racism, as well as the group of peoples um, of indigenous peoples, um, pe peasants or campesinos and Rome people. So they're recognizing historic violence against other groups as well. So when they were elected, they began to bring reparations then into the government agenda. Francia went to COP27 in 2022. Uh, it was one of the first things she did internationally. And she uh, made the link between reparations and environmental justice. And she argued that um, many of the damages um, that, the, that they're talking about in terms of environmental damages um, in these international spaces are a legacy of colonialism and a legacy of that, that introduction of, of colonial extractivism. And as such, um, we cannot separate the, the conversation on losses and damages for environmental degradation and climate change and um, historical reparations for colonialism and enslavement. And also that victims of colonialism must be leading voices in the strategies and struggles to protect what she calls La Casa Grande, which is the Mother Earth, basically. Um, secondly, on her agenda, she has um, been forwarding and developing a, a whole new relationship with Africa. So although Af uh, Colombia has a huge Afro-descendant population, diplomatically, the relationship with Africa has historically not been hugely strong. In fact, many embassies were closed under previous governments. So she has, <clears throat> she has been, um, there is a work to reopen many of those embassies, but also she has, um, well, what she, this, this whole Africa strategy is known as the reencuentro, or the re-meeting, the reconnection with Africa. So it's about Africa and her diaspora um, coming back together again. And the, these principles are kind of principles that would underpin international development action, South to South cooperation, economic solidarity, actions around memory and culture, political, economic and diplomatic relations. So she thought we already have um, several people from the Black Movement in Colombia as ambassadors now in South Africa, Kenya, Ghana, and soon to be in Senegal and Ethiopia. We're hoping to, that there will be um, embassies opened in Nigeria, um, the African Union. Um, there's initiatives to improve visa processes and flight routes. At the moment, to get to Africa from, from Colombia, you have to go pretty much via Europe. It takes a very, very long time, and it's often very difficult to get visas, and vice versa as well. Um, and participation in, in the re regional dialogues of the sixth region, which is the sixth region of Africa, um, in the framework of the, the forthcoming Pan-African um, Congress, the Pan-African Conference, which is going to be held next this year. Um, so all of this is seen as part of the debt that is owed to Afro descendants in the sixth region. Um, and so she's leading that through the kind of diplomatic and international relations sphere. And then uh, finally, last year, uh, that says 2013, it should say 2023, um, the vice president launched our very own national intersectorial reparations commission. Um, it's called intersectorial because it's made up of various different sectors of the, of the government. So its objective is to um, basically bring these different sectors of government together to think through um, policies, programs, actions to repair um, and overcome the effects of racism, racial discrimination and colonialism. And it should say enslavement. Um, but I think in the actual objective of the declaration of the decree, it doesn't say enslavement, but later on in the, in the document, it does. Um, and then also to study the nature of the historic debt and damages um, caused by the transatlantic slave trade, trafficking and colonialism and structural racism. So she presides, um, or the vice presidency presides this commission. Um, and as I say, it's made up of all these different sectors of society, which means we can have a kind of comprehensive integral approach to reparations. So Ministry of Agriculture, Finance, Rural Development, Employment, Education, Health. And then there's the National Archives, National Anthropology Institute, um, National Museum, National Remembrance Centre, all coming together to think about what reparations need to look like. Um, and under, within their actions, they're going to be doing studies, evaluations of the law to see what effects laws have had on Afro-descendant people, define strategies, create research centres, create new archives, 
new museums or memorable um, places in commemorate international days um, and do kind of south to south cooperation and exchanges. So one of the first activities we're going to do is a kind of interchange with uh, the Carib Caribbean, Caribbean or the CARICOM Reparations Commission. Um, while it's a huge achievement to have a reparation agenda within the government, we also have to remember that no government is forever and we need to maintain always <clears throat> the rhythm and the strength of social movement. Um, so um, there's a big part of the commission to kind of do with participation and making sure that um, people are participating in that, but also making sure that the reparations movement itself outside of government remains strong. So these are two photos from two initial activities that we've done, um, which we're calling regional dialogues on reparations. Um, the first one is in Huachine, which is a consejo comunitario, that means a collective land of Afro-descendant people that was that used to be a hacienda. So it used to be um, a work camp for enslaved people, um, a farm or an hacienda where they produced um, sugarcane or agricultural goods under enslavement. Um, in the 80s, the black movement who lived in that area of Colombia um, began a process to reclaim that land and it's now a collectively owned land by black community. And the other photo is from Timbiki, which is a community um, on the Pacific coast of Colombia, where uh, which was all part of kind of these slave, these um, mining enclaves um, all across the Pacific coast. Um, so some of the um, recommendations that have come out of these dialogues, we've been kind of talking to them about the commission and what they recommend how the commission should work, is the importance of doing local and community-based research and, and remembrance exercises, because there's a lot of memory, particularly among elder people, um, around what happened during slavery. So in these exercises, we've been doing all these different kinds of memory exercises and bringing through stories, songs, dances, literature that recognizes and remembers things that happened during slavery and their impacts today. Um, also we want to identify emblematic cases that help to demonstrate the relationship between the past and the present. Um, so there's a lot of palenques in the, in the region, which are basically like maroon communities where enslaved people escaped and set up communities. There's a lot of those around. Um, and then identifying concrete measures that can repair the damages and transform the conditions um, for the non-continuation of racism and racial injustice. And these are all, the people in the, in the workshops often cited things like strengthening land rights, strengthening self and governance, investment in infrastructure for communities, um, own education processes to decolonize the mind, um and um kind of memory exercises as well so that is where we are at the moment <laughs> it's a very exciting time these dialogues just began really like in the last couple of weeks um and uh, it's the beginning of this of this new moment in in the reparations agenda in colombia okay. i'll leave it there so there's time for some questions and comments and discussion and for peter yeah, great. Well, let's uh, all ask for a round of applause. Thank you so much, Esther. That was really a tour de force, is, you know, taking us to such a broad <laughs> international perspective, mm -hmm. but also a long view that really helps us to contextualize the, the Colombian uh, situation now and just how progressive and, you know, forward thinking it is. It's very exciting to see that. Um, yeah. Esther was keen to open up the conversation to make this a kind of round table. So to that end, we've invited uh, Professor Peter Way to act as a, a discussant. Um, Peter, perhaps I can invite you to take the floor for up, up to 10 minutes so that we have time for some other questions uh, to share your thoughts on, on what Esther has presented and your own understandings. Peter? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Esther. That was really, uh, really good to get um, great um, wide, broad and historical context for the whole issue of reparations. Um, so, yeah, a couple of questions come to mind as you were talking. Um, one is the relationship of enslavement to reparations versus the relationship of kind of more recent racism uh, to reparations. So you quoted Carlos Rosero, who said, well, it's all one continuous thing. And, you know, that's perfectly understandable. Uh, and I agree that it is. But I wonder if I wonder what you think about whether strategically, in terms of wanting to achieve particular aims, 
you know, are there certain benefits to emphasizing enslavement as being the key thing, as opposed to emphasizing more recent forms of, of racism and violence and racialized displacement and so forth. Um, so I just wonder if, you know, st strategically in terms of negotiating with the government and so on, so it's one emphasis is likely to be more productive than the other. So then in, uh, connected to that is also the balance between uh, making enslavement the kind of key issue, which seemed to be, you know, it was pretty prominent in, in, in what you were talking about and everything you, you said was enslavement was the key issue. But then also there was about colonial oppression. You kind of mentioned coloniality, colonial oppression uh, various times. And, you know, indeed the new... Uh, the new uh, Comisión Intersectorial Nacional is reparación histórica, is re historical reparation to overcome the effects of racism, racial discrimination and, coloni and colonialism. So they're not actually mentioning enslavement there at all. Um, because enslavement obviously targets people of African descent, although that's putting a bracket round the very numerous indigenous people who were enslaved in Latin America, especially in Brazil. Um, but colonial oppression really uh, embraces a much wider population. So, you know, what about in, in, reparations for indigenous people? What about reparation? And you mentioned this, you know, peasants, uh, people, uh, peasant farmers and so forth. So if you then expand your reparations to address the effects of coloniality rather than uh, just enslavement, then the whole reparations agenda becomes really an agenda for eliminating inequality in general, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that that kind of you know that are reparations supposed to be transformative or just sort of uh, you know affirmative action programs for people of African descent, etc. So I just wondered if you if you could maybe expand on that a little bit. Um, then there were some questions about which are kind of you know in a way related about. Uh, how to trace or how to look at the, the relationship between, you know, recent forms of violence and displacement and uh, it's the, the impacts on, on, on people of African descent. So, for example, I think, in, you, you know, you quoted a CONPA um, report that you obviously uh, uh, were involved with and the map you showed, you know, there was a lot of red on that map. Um, and you then said, I think that 56 or 58% of displacements were from municipalities where Afro, uh, Afro Colombian people lived. You know, and that, uh, so what I'm just interested to know what kind of data you were using to generate that figure. Because how, you I know, mean, what percentage of a, mun a municipality's population has to be Afro Colombian? in order for you to say that's an Afro-Colombian territory or municipality. Because, I mean, those municipalities presumably were also including a lot of non-Black people who were also suffering the effects of violent displacement. Which doesn't mean to say that displacement isn't racialized, because they could, they could be people who, even if they aren't Afro-Colombian or they don't identify as Afro-Colombian, they're still people who might be racialized as non-white and, and suffer the effects of discrimination without them being uh, seen as or identifying themselves as Afro-Colombian. Um, so that also raises the question for me of, you know, who are the beneficiaries of these reparations programs? Uh, is it only people who self-identify as Black? And then in what, you know, in what context? In a, in a, in a, a census context or something? Um, so there may be many people who are descendants of enslaved people. So even if we're only focusing on enslavement, you could think there are lots of people who are descended from people who were enslaved who don't identify as black. So where would they sit? Or would they be beneficiaries or, or, or not? How does one kind of work that out? OK, so that's one set of questions. Um, and then another another set of questions Have was... I feel like I'm my Bible again. <laughs> Yes, I, yes, it does bring some help. <laughs> um, I mean, I, 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 I'm also interested in, I mean, Colombia seems to have done really well, um, mm. at least on paper and in terms of, you know, state laws and legislation and so on. 
compared to the rest of, the, of Latin America in terms of reparations and, and these kind of quite progressive um, legal measures and political measures that have been taken. I just wondered if you had any reflections on, on why, why that's the case. Why does Colombia stand out, even vis-a-vis -vis Brazil, uh, where, as we know, there's there was, you know, a comprehensive set of, uh, of legal measures and affirmative action programs and so forth. Um, and a final question, I guess, is, you know, what do you see as the future for, for Francia Marquez especially? When I was in Colombia last year, I spoke to the leader of, uh, of an Afro-Colombian uh, Afro uh, movement, I won't name him, um, who was, you know, who said, hey, yeah, well, it's good that Francia Marquez has got to power, but really Petro has given her very little power, her budget is very small and so on. So he was a bit um, less, he was a bit pessimistic about what she would be able to achieve. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. Thank you very much, Peter. That's quite, um, yeah, quite a, a comprehensive group of questions for Esther. We have um, about half an hour left for our session and we will invite questions from the floor. And I can see there is one a question, a couple of questions coming now in the chat. Um, Esther, I invite you to uh, offer any initial reflections yes. on Peter's questions and then we can open up the wider. Okay. So, on, so thank you, Peter, for all those questions. I think... Um, on the first set of questions, those are precisely the issues. Oh, how do I stand? The issues that we're um, trying to work through at the moment. These are all the kind of big questions that this commission has to has to figure out. And it's 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 such a new process in Colombia that it is going to be it's going to be difficult. But that's kind of what we're what we're looking at at the moment. So the first question, I think, around um, the relationship between reparations for enslavement and reparations for more recent racial violence and, and inequality. I mean, the, we have the decree on law on collective reparations for Afro-descendant victims of armed conflict. Um, that is like a separate law and norm that um, was a huge achievement from the movement. Um, but the victims law in general in Colombia only goes back as far as 1985 in terms of I think, uh, um, actions that were carried out. So it's a very much focused on contemporary um, violence. And, and so there's a clear distinction between, between the two, if we think of it like that. Um, but as you, as you mentioned, the, the National Reparations Commission um, doesn't only focus on colonialism and slavery, it also includes racial discrimination and racism. So that would then include more recent, not just historic, but more recent kind of manifestations of racism. And I think that um, rather than being perhaps more strategic to focus on, on slavery, from the conversations that I've had so far in different communities and with different actors, I almost feel like it's more strategic to, to focus on, on this kind of continuum of violence because it's easier for people to understand. So a lot of times when you talk about slavery, reparations for slavery, the response is, oh, well, this was something that happened in the past. This is no longer relevant. We should be moving on. Forget about what's happening in the past and, and live in the present. But when we start to discuss the relationship between the past and the present and the fact that we are still suffering um, the legacy of this enslavement and that manifests as structural racism, rac uh, police violence, violence within the armed conflict, um, you know, the fact that somebody can't access health care or education, all of those other forms of racism, it becomes much more tangible to understand why it's important to talk about historical reparations. So that click moment for a lot of people, because the reparations conversation on Colombia on historic reparations is quite really quite new at the, at the national level. The click moment is when we precisely make that relationship between past and present. So I think what we're going to see and we're already starting to see articles coming out in the press from the right trying to argue that argue against it um, and, and saying precisely this is a historical issue, this is not a contemporary issue. So I think it's actually strategic to try and really um, highlight that continuance and, and the importance of contemporary um, racism. Um, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, so the commission, as you say, its objective mentions colonialism and didn't mention enslavement. When we launched the commission, actually the vice president um, made a statement saying this declaration, or not declaration, this decree should say enslavement. And it was a grave error that it doesn't say enslavement. And I'm pretty sure in the first draft, 
it did say enslavement. And I'm not sure at what point enslavement was taken out of the objective. But um, she has called for an amendment of the decree to include explicitly the word enslavement. But of course, um, we included or it includes colonialism as well, precisely for the reasons that that um, Dr. Wade is saying. Um, it, we're including beyond Afro-descendant people, indigenous peoples and other groups that are historically marginalized or victimized in Colombia. Um, and there's a whole piece around um, genocide of indigenous peoples, for example, and, and reparations for, for indigenous peoples. Again, we have to kind of work through that and work out how that looks because the indigenous movement doesn't necessarily have its own reparations agenda yet. You know, there's different... It depends how we discuss reparations. Some movements maybe talk about reparations, but using other language, um, or maybe they're more focused on self-determination or, or other kind of ways of talking about freedom and liberation. Um, but that's kind of part of those conversations that have to happen with the, with the communities and with the ethnic authorities um, through all the different participation processes. But definitely colonialism gives us this wider framework to understand um, all of the different forms of oppression that are a legacy of colonialism. Um, this question, to expand the colonial agenda, I don't know. Um, oh yeah, so in terms of the disproportionate impact of the armed conflict on Afro-descendant peoples, so that map that I showed um, is, is a methodology that was initially um, developed by AfroLS, which is an organization that works on displacement of Afro-descendant people. Um, and one of the problems they found was precisely that because many Afro-descendant people don't necessarily identify as Black or are invisibilized through different ways in terms of statistics or statistic taking, it was very difficult. And even just because of the lack of information, it was very difficult to know exactly how many Afro-descendant people were victims of displacement. So I think in the 2000s, they developed this method of kind of, rather than looking at the individual victims of displacement, looking at the territories that they were coming from. And by showing that the there was a disproportionate impact of acts, huge ma acts of massive displacement in black territories, they were able to show this um, disproportionate impact. And the way they characterized territories was one, through um, percentages of Afro-descendant people, according to the census. Um, two, the... the um, existence of Afro-descendant, of, of, of a significant number, and I'm not sure what that significant number is, of Afro-descendant organizations, and three, uh, the existence of collective territories. So when those three things um, come together, you, that's what we would characterize as an Afro-descendant territory. Um, but of course, many of those African-descendant territories that you saw on that map are also indigenous territories, and indigenous peoples are one of the other groups that are most affected by um, displacement and armed conflict as well. And what we've seen since the peace agreement um, between the FARC and the government, and the, um, the as the FARC left those territories and other armed groups or other, or including dissidents of the FARC moved in, there's been an, even a shift, and now there's an even greater um, disproportionality in terms of where uh, forced displacement is happening, and so even more um, displacement happening in the Pacific region where Afro-descendant and Indigenous peoples live. In terms of the beneficiaries, yeah, that's one of those questions that we, that the Commission needs to work through and figure out how it's going to work. We're not only talking about Afro-descendant people who live in rural areas or on ter or collective territories. Reparations is for all Afro-descendant people, but how that's defined in terms of beneficiaries is, is something, or victor or subjects, is something that needs to be worked out. But I do think that it's very likely that these, these processes are going to be have much more of a collective than an individual focus anyway. So I think it's very much going to be focused on territories, focused on communities, focused on kind of wider actions. Um, why does Colombia stand out? I think Colombia stands out precisely because of this, um, what I call decolonial movement that it has where um, the movement has really defined what, what Afro-descendant struggle can and can look like in terms of a real grassroots-based land-focused um, movement. So less, there's been so much, well, certainly with the organizations that I work with, I know there's a lot of diversity within Afro-Colombian organizations, but those movements that have focused on land, self-determination and autonomy, um, and perhaps less so on affirmative actions, 
um, or inclusion in or visibility in, I think have really set a kind of new language and discourse in terms of what the Afro-descendant struggle looks like, which is much more similar to a lot of indigenous struggles as well, which is not necessarily we want inclusion in the system that has oppressed us for the last 300 years, but we want to be able to make our own decisions. We want to be able to have our own forms of education. We want to have our own forms of health, um, ancestral medicine, our own midwives, our own um, infrastructure, everything that's kind of rooted in ancestral visions. So I think that strength of that movement has is definitely what kind of enables a kind of different way and new way of looking at um, right struggles. Um, and the future for Francia, I mean, yeah, as you say, without naming who, who um, made that observation, it, it's, it's um, certainly true that that's been a, it's a very difficult route. Um, and as we're in a we're in a coalition government, that means that um, you know not necessarily there's even agreements on on the politics politics of um, of the vice president and the president in all areas. Um, and it's been very difficult in terms of resources, in terms of um, possibilities. I think that she has, over the last couple of years since they've been in power, um, really converted into uh, an international leader. And I think that um, you know her presence and her role in in the Colombian government has has activated and motivated Afro descendant movements and other governments that uh, perhaps agree with her politics in a in a new and amazing way. When Ralph Gonsalves was um, in Colombia for the launch of the commission, he uh, he made a call to the Colombian people and he said, you have a gem here, you have a precious gem and you must protect her because it only maybe once in a lifetime can a country or can you have a leader like this. It was a really beautiful speech. And he said, you know, she will stumble and she will fall, but uh, I'm calling on you to hold her hand and, and um, walk with her. And I think that there's set, there's a real feeling around the world of this of a new way that politics can be done. I mean, she's she's so authentic and so real in terms of what she represents that it kind of motivates this new feeling. So I think with that backing and that support internationally, that's what will keep kind of helping help her her as a role. Um, it's not necessarily determined whether or not she'll run as president in the next um, in the next elections. Petro can't run again because we only have, because presidents can only run for one term in Colombia. So that is a possibility and an option. But and I think really that international backing would be absolutely essential there. Um, but she's really kind of pushing with her team to get tangible results as well, so that people can really feel that this kind of politics is not just discourse, because often it's very easy to talk about equality and uh, redistribution and, um, you know, all of these love, these kind of powerful words. But for people who are living day-to-day -day, uh, inequality, economic, social inequality, who don't have access to basic things like running water, education, health, they need to see tangible tangible results, don't they? And so I think there's a there's a big focus on on getting tangible results that people can really feel like this kind of left socialist Afrocentric um, politics is real and not just discourse. Great, right, thank you so much for that um, very comprehensive response to Peter's questions. So I can see that there are three questions online. I just want to scan the room as well to see if any folks in here want to ask any questions. Okay, I don't see any hands at this moment. So I'm just going to open up the question box here. Um, so I think the first question we have, thank you to you, Esther. Uh, is the commission focused exclusively on the responsibility of the Colombian government uh -huh. towards African American communities, or is there also a project for Colombia, the yeah. country to raise reparations uh -huh. demand from the European Union? We'll take all three at, at once because we're getting short on time, that's okay. Um, how are historical reparations primarily directed towards Afro-Colombian individuals juxtaposed with reparations for individuals affected by the armed conflict? You developed that already a little bit in mm -hmm. your response, so perhaps you can okay. say a little bit more about that. Um, and from the same uh, person, uh, what has been the overall public opinion regarding the work of the Commission of Reparations? That would be interesting. It appears to be a somewhat isolated effort. How does mm -hmm. the Commission strive to garner attention engage other sectors of the Colombian society. Okay. So I'll just keep those questions open so you can have a... Great. So the first question is a really good question. 
Um, and it's very interesting because I, I mentioned that the, the UN is now debating a, a UN declaration on the rights of people of African descent, and several countries have proposed including reparations in that declaration. Um, and European countries have said, no, we don't want to include reparations in the declaration unless you include what they call internal reparations, which is basically you repair your communities, but we're not going to do it. <laughs> so it's a really interesting issue because this commission appears to be doing that. It's a commission and it's a government that's made a commitment to repair its own uh, population. Um, slavery was abolished in, um, nine, in 1851, but independence was achieved a long, lot, several decades before that. So um, the Colombian government or the Colombian state or country has also responsibilities in terms of, of slavery, not just um, the European countries. But of course, that doesn't exclude um, the responsibility of other actors, the European countries, but also the private actors that I mentioned um, in the presentation. So this is kind of, I suppose, a first step in terms of reparations. And this commission, its focus is on, or its mandate is on finding ways that the government or the state can repair its own people. But the, gov but the commission will also develop um, an international agenda. And within that international agenda, we would have to look at what other actions need to take place. But but a, a big part of it will be um, interacting with and linking up with the global reparations movement. So with the CARICOM movement, with what's happening in Africa, which, with what will eventually happen, um, hopefully at the international court. Um, the recommendation certainly um, is that the, the, this commission would kind of become part of that um, that intercontinental international agenda and, and all that, that that implies. But initially it's starting off with a kind of internal reparations process. Um, so yeah, I already mentioned the kind of difference between reparations for armed conflict and reparations for enslavement. For some people it's a continuum and it's one and the same. But in terms of the norms and laws, there is a very succinct specific law around reparations for the armed conflict. But even within that law or that decree, Communities who have had the opportunity to define what reparations for the armed conflict look like have often raised issues of the historical underlining um, structures and legacies of the past. So even if, so if reparations for the armed conflict um, isn't just, many black communities aren't just calling for compensation or, or indemnization for violence it, uh, lived, but they're often calling for kind of more structural infrastructure approaches that would help to repair this, this historic legacy of um, underdevelopment and state abandonment and, and other things. So often um, the reparations plans that are coming out of the armed conflict transitional justice process, look at things like building schools, look at things like land titles, look at things like healthcare services, look at things like preserving collective cultural identity, which all kind of speaks to the historical nature as well. So, I, so re they really are very connected, even if they are housed in two different normative frameworks. What has been the overall problem? So the commission is very new. Um, so there's not a huge kind of explosion of pub public opinion yet on reparations. I'm kind of waiting for that to happen because <laughs> I think it will. <laughs> As, as, we, as it gets more um, visibility. There were a few articles that have come out by different um, different kind of journalists, independent journalists, mainly a lot of, a lot of the kind of right-wing ones criticizing the whole idea of reparations. Um, and then from a lot of um, others celebrating the idea as well, but it's a very kind of early discussion really. So there's not a huge response to the commission. The commission is gonna have um, a big, uh, what we're planning at the moment is a big communication strategy. And that's something that we've learned from one, from the from the Caribbean, from the CARICOM commissions, that they really found the need to um, do a lot of public education. Even in the Caribbean where there was a big reparations movement, not everyone in the country was aware of or involved with the reparations movement. So it was necessary to have a big communications, media and public education campaign. And that's what we're planning in Colombia, because it, the idea is that we can generate a national conversation on reparations um, in which everyone's involved. It's not just a conversation for African Senate people. It's a conversation for everyone um, or, or indigenous peoples. It's a conversation for the whole of society. And, and it's really seen as a, a way of, you know, a reconciliation of society. 
um, and a reconciliation of all the different sectors of society. So it's something that kind of, you know, we want to want to have educational materials in schools. We want to have different um, media uh, uh, materials that can really begin to generate this interest and discussion in the conversation. But it's early days. It was only launched in October, and it's only just getting going now. Yeah. Good. We're getting it on the ground floor to learn yeah. about it, which is great. Yeah. Um, so I'm just surveying again to see if any folks in the room or online would, would like to offer an additional question. We've got a few minutes left. Okay, maybe I'll jump in. I'll get him here through this. Um, I'd be quite interested to hear a little bit more about how Colombia sees its role at the UN in these processes that you've touched on a little bit, particularly around the declaration. Mm. Um, yeah, in what ways is it showing, is yeah. it showing leadership? Then? So, I mean, Colombia, as you probably anyone who's kind of been within the UN and human rights spaces knows Colombia is like one of the countries that has most signed up to different declarations and well not declarations but international instruments on human rights um, and is often very active in different uh, intergovernmental mechanisms but um, since the the vice president came in um, she uh, from the very beginning kind of set the tone in terms of how we want to now approach the issue of Afro-descendant rights as a government, because one of her uh, functions in her mandate is that, is to support and accompany the international Afro-descendant rights movement. Um, so uh, from the from the launching of the permanent forum on, on people of African descent, since then, her team has this kind of begun to um, develop a strategy for international issues around race and ethnicity, um, and really kind of positioning Colombia to take a role of leadership in things like the negotiation for this declaration, in the spaces of the permanent forum um, and other spaces. So the kind of thing, there's instruction basically through the through the foreign office for those um, for that to be an, an important issue within the agenda of, of the missions in New York and the mission in um, in Geneva with the declaration. Um, the the contributions that the um, the Columbia um, mission has been pushing are very much in line with the vision of rights and the vision of um, of the mo of um, the agenda of the government. So they've been, um, for example, highlighting the importance of recognition of Afro descendant people as peoples with an S on the end. And when you're recognised as peoples rather than people as individuals, uh, that then implies the right to self-determination under international law. So that's very important um, recognition, um, the inclusion of the issue of reparations in that, the inclusion of an intersection, intersectional, intersectional approach. So um, as well as uh, ethnic people's rights being high on the agenda, um, women's rights and, and LGBTQI plus um, communities' rights are also part of the, the agenda of the of the government and the vice presidency. So they've been also um, insisting on an intersectional approach. The, the vice president has recently become a minister as well. She's recently opened the new Ministry of Equality. Um, so that brings together kind of many of these identity um, issues and inequality issues, which would then be reflected in the foreign policy of, of Colombia in these different international spaces. Folks, we've come to time, so I think we're going to have to wrap <laughs> up. Um, but let me first just thank all those who have joined us online. It's great to have such a big audience online. Thank you to all those who have been able to come in person uh, to join us. Perhaps you get an extra question for Esther after. Um, and thank you to Professor Peter Wade for offering uh, uh, the role as discussant and for offering some questions to help us to dig deeper into the case. And finally, of course, a huge thank you to Esther, who's taken us to a really fantastic presentation of what's going on now in Colombia and giving us reason to be excited about that. So thank you for that. And thank you for your leadership as a scholar and an activist in this global movement. And we appreciate the opportunity to hear from your work. So please thank you. Thank you.